This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Andy Minter. A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. Book Three, Chapter Four Calm in Storm. Dr. Manette did not return until the morning of the fourth day of his absence. So much of what had happened in that dreadful time as could be kept from the knowledge of Lucy was so well concealed from her that not until long afterwards, when France and she were far apart, did she know that eleven hundred defenceless prisoners of both sexes and all ages had been killed by the populace that four days and nights had been darkened by this deed of horror, and that the air around her had been tainted by the slain. She only knew that there had been an attack upon the prison, that all political prisoners had been in danger, and that some had been dragged out by the crowd and murdered. To Mr. Lorry the doctor communicated, under an injunction of secrecy on which he had no need to dwell, that the crowd had taken him through a scene of carnage to the prison of La Force, that in the prison he had found a self-appointed tribunal sitting, before which the prisoners were brought singly, and by which they were rapidly ordered to be put forth to be massacred, or to be released, or, in a few cases, to be sent back to their cells, that, presented by his conductors to this tribunal, he had announced himself by name and profession as having been for eighteen years a secret and unaccused prisoner in the Bastille, that one of the bodies so sitting in judgment had risen and identified him, and that this man was Defarge. That hereupon he had ascertained, through the registers on the table, that his son-in-law was among the living prisoners, and had pleaded hard to the tribunal, of whom some members were asleep and some awake, some dirty with murder and some clean, some sober and some not, for his life and liberty, that in the first frantic greetings lavished on himself as a notable sufferer under the overthrown system, it had been accorded to him to have Charles Darnay brought before the lawless court and examined, that he seemed on the point of being at once released— when the tide in his favour met with some unexplained check, not intelligible to the doctor, which led to a few words of secret conference, that the man sitting as president had then informed Dr. Manette that the prisoner must remain in custody, but should, for his sake, be held inviolate in safe custody, that immediately, on a signal, the prisoner was removed to the interior of the prison again, but that he, the doctor, had then so strongly pleaded for permission to remain and assure himself that his son-in-law was, through no malice or mischance, delivered to the concourse, whose murderous yells outside the gate had often drowned the proceedings, that he had obtained the permission, and had remained in that hall of blood until the danger was over. The sights he had seen there— with brief snatches of food and sleep by intervals, shall remain untold. The mad joy over the prisoners who were saved has astounded him scarcely less than the mad ferocity against those who were cut to pieces. One prisoner there was, he said, who had been discharged into the street free, but at whom a mistaken savage had thrust a pike as he passed out. Being besought to go to him and dress the wound, the doctor had passed out at the same gate, and had found him in the arms of a company of Samaritans who were seated on the bodies of their victims. With an inconsistency as monstrous as anything in this awful nightmare, they had helped the healer, and tended the wounded man with the gentlest solicitude, had made a litter for him, and escorted him carefully from the spot had then caught up their weapons, and plunged anew into a butchery so dreadful that the doctor had covered his eyes with his hands, and swooned away in the midst of it. As Mr. Lorry received these confidences, and as he watched the face of his friend, now sixty-two years of age, 
A misgiving arose within him that such dread experiences would revive the old danger. But he had never seen his friend in his present aspect. He had never at all known him in his present character. For the first time the doctor felt, now, that his suffering was strength and power. For the first time he felt that in that sharp fire he had slowly forged the iron which could break the prison door of his daughter's husband and deliver him. "'It all tended to a good end, my friend. It was not mere waste and ruin. As my beloved child was helpful in restoring me to myself, I will be helpful now in restoring the dearest part of herself to her. By the aid of heaven, I will do it.' Thus, Dr. Manette. And when Jarvis Lorry saw the kindled eyes, the resolute face, the calm, strong look and bearing of a man whose life always seemed to him to have been stopped like a clock for so many years, and then set going again with an energy which had lain dormant during the cessation of its usefulness, he believed. Greater things than the doctor had at that time to contend with, would have yielded before his persevering purpose. While he kept himself in his place as a physician, whose business was with all degrees of mankind, bond and free, rich and poor, bad and good, he used his personal influence so wisely that he was soon the inspecting physician of three prisons, and among them of La Force. He could now assure Lucy that her husband was no longer confined alone, but was mixed with the general body of prisoners. He saw her husband weakly, and brought sweet messages to her, straight from his lips. Sometimes her husband himself sent a letter to her, though never by the doctor's hand. But she was not permitted to write to him, for among the many wild suspicions of plots in the prisons, the wildest of all pointed at emigrants who were known to have made friends or permanent connections abroad. This new life of the doctor's was an anxious life, no doubt. Still, the sagacious Mr. Lorry saw that there was a new sustaining pride in it. Nothing unbecoming tinged the pride. It was a natural and worthy one. But he observed it as a curiosity. The doctor knew that up to that time his imprisonment had been associated in the minds of his daughter and his friend with his personal affliction deprivation and weakness. Now that this was changed, and he knew himself to be invested through that old trial with forces to which they both looked for Charles's ultimate safety and deliverance, he became so far exalted by the change that he took the lead and direction, and required them as the weak to trust to him as the strong. The preceding relative positions of himself and Lucy were reversed, yet only as the liveliest gratitude and affection could reverse them, for he could have no pride but in rendering some service to her who had rendered so much to him. "'All curious to see,' thought Mr. Lorry, in his amiably shrewd way, "'but all natural and right. So take the lead, my dear friend, and keep it. It couldn't be in better hands.' But, though the doctor tried hard, and never ceased trying, to get Charles Darnay set at liberty, or at least to get him brought to trial, the public current of the time set too strong and fast for him. The new era began. The king was tried, doomed, and beheaded. The republic of liberty, equality, fraternity, or death, declared for victory or death against the world in arms. The black flag waved night and day from the great towers of Notre Dame. Three hundred thousand men, summoned to rise against the tyrants of the earth, rose from all the varying soils of France, as if the dragon's teeth had been sown broadcast, and had yielded fruit equally on hill and plain, on rock, in gravel and alluvial mud, under the bright sky of the south, and under the clouds of the north, in fell and forest, in the vineyards and the olive grounds, and among the cropped grass and the stubble of the court, along the fruitful banks of the broad rivers, and in the sand of the seashore. 
What private solicitude could rear itself against the deluge of year one of liberty, the deluge rising from below, not falling from above, and with the windows of heaven shut, not opened? There was no pause, no pity, no peace, no interval of relenting rest, no measurement of time. Though days and nights circled as regularly as when time was young, and the evening and morning were the first day, other count of time there was none. Hold of it was lost in the raging fever of a nation, as it is in the fever of one patient. Now, breaking the unnatural silence of a whole city, the executioner showed the people the head of the king. And now, it seemed, almost in the same breath, the head of his fair wife, which had had eight weary months of imprisoned widowhood and misery to turn it grey. And yet, observing the strange law of contradiction which obtains in all such cases, the time was long while it flamed by so fast. A revolutionary tribunal in the capital, and forty or fifty thousand revolutionary committees all over the land, a law of the suspected, which struck away all security for liberty or life, and delivered over any good and innocent person to any bad and guilty one. Prisons, gorged with people who had committed no offence, and could obtain no hearing. These things became the established order and nature of appointed things, and seemed to be ancient usage before they were many weeks old. Above all, one hideous figure grew as familiar as if it had been before the general gaze from the foundations of the world, the figure of the sharp female called La Guillotine. It was the popular theme for jests. It was the best cure for headache. It infallibly prevented the hair from turning grey. It imparted a peculiar delicacy to the complexion. It was the national razor which shaved close. Who kissed La Guillotine, looked through the little window, and sneezed into the sack. It was the sign of the regeneration of the human race. It superseded the cross. Models of it were worn on breasts from which the cross was discarded, and it was bowed down to, and believed in, where the cross was denied. It sheared off heads so many, that it and the ground it most polluted were a rotten red. It was taken to pieces, like a toy puzzle for a young devil, and was put together again when the occasion wanted it. It hushed the eloquent, struck down the powerful, abolished the beautiful and good. Twenty-two friends of high public mark, twenty-one living and one dead. It had lopped the heads off in one morning, in as many minutes. The name of the strong man of old scripture had descended to the chief functionary who worked it, but so armed he was stronger than his namesake, and blinder, and tore away the gates of God's own temple every day. Among these terrors, and the brood belonging to them, the doctor walked with a steady head, confident in his power, cautiously persistent in his end, never doubting that he would save Lucy's husband at last. Yet the current of the time swept by, so strong and deep, and carried the time away so fiercely, that Charles had lain in prison one year and three months when the doctor was thus steady and confident. So much more wicked and distracted had the revolution grown in that December month that the rivers of the south were encumbered with the bodies of the violently drowned by night, and prisoners were shot in lines and squares under the southern wintry sun. Still the doctor walked among the terrors with a steady head. No man better known than he in Paris at that day. No man in a stranger situation. Silent, humane, indispensable in hospital and prison, using his art equally among assassins and victims. He was a man apart. In the exercise of his skill— the appearance and the story of the Bastille captive removed him from all other men. He was not suspected or brought in question any more than if he had indeed been recalled to life some eighteen years before, or were a spirit 
Moving Among Mortals. End of Book Three, Chapter Four.